leave the picture, yeah, just the music and then leave the picture. Good afternoon. If you can take your seats, please, so we can begin our program. Welcome to our Radio Museum. My name is Maggie Mangasarian Goshen. Most of you know who I am. I've been here for the last 22 years volunteering. Uh, most of our events are held at the chapel, and today's event as well is co-sponsored with National Association for Armenian Studies, one of the oldest Armenian studies department that is very active in Boston, Massachusetts, and on November 2nd, they'll be opening their new building, and it's one organization that's very active, helping new and upcoming scholars, uh, scholarships, publications, you name it. If you would like to know more about the NASA organization, we do have journals outside information. Rupen, Derbedos, uh, Rupen Berberian is here, who is a co-chair in LA. Uh, uh, Dr. Kitapjan, who is here, as well as Jesse Matosian, who is present. Our next event will be on November the 10th. We were hoping to have Robert Fiss to give us a talk. Thanks to my friend Misak for arranging it. Unfortunately, at the last minute, he backed off because he had prior engagements that takes precedence, so he postponed it, hopefully, for next year. Instead, we'll be having a different approach. Uh, the movie, The Promise, uh, some of us have a different feelings about the movie, including myself. But then lately, um, I had them come and do a presentation behind the scene, con contextualizing the movie, behind the scenes, what transpired, what kind of um, information they were using, how they were using the children who were in the, at present during the ma massacres and the psychologists and um, other therapists that were present to make the movie. So it's going to be behind the scenes of the movie, not the movie itself. The movie is two hours and we can't do it, but it's going to be clips of the movie and with testimonies, and at the same time, all in background information, and that's done with Armenian Film Foundation, Karla Garabedian. That's on November the 10th at 4 o'clock, so this is a last-minute change for us. That's why I don't have the flyer. Some of you are wondering why we have Janet Samuelian's picture on the screen. Janet was a great supporter of the Aradiskijo Museum. She was a freelancer. I met her in 1998. She was a regular at our lectures, and she used to write articles about the museum. She abruptly left us um, due to health reasons, and I couldn't do an event today without honoring her. And we're very fortunate to have some of her, his friend, her friends, as well as his son, Marco. Would you please stand up? This is Marco, Janet's son. Thank you for coming. Uh, Janet also, Janet's story is in the book. <laughs> Janet's story is in um, Rosemary's book, um, um, and I didn't know anything about Salmas or Hoi region, except I knew that Rafi was from Salmas. That's all I knew. Uh, Ten years ago or more, the Professor Vanessian had a conference on Armenians in Iran. This is when I met Rosemary, and um, Janet introduced me to her. This was my first time that I met Rosemary. She told me that she wrote the story about her grandmother who survived the, the atrocities of 1918, and that's how we befriended her. Janet... You had, I'm sorry, Rosemary, you had this at the conference. She had made 10 of those pictures from the book that she had published, uh, The Survivors, and it shows her grandfather, how he was massacred in front of his gran her grandmother. I brought all those uh, candles here, and it's been in the museum since then when we randomly use it for e events. So I just wanted to share that what you have done 10 years ago is still at the museum, and it's still continuing. Just a brief background uh, about Rosemary. She's very active. She's one of those persons who is very quiet. She doesn't talk about her accomplishments, but she works behind the scenes. She's an outstanding artist, as well as a scholar, literary person. She speaks fluently Persian, Armenian, English, French, and anything else that I forgot you can add to it. Just a little bit of background about Rosemary. She's a sociologist who earned her doctorate degree at the Sorbonne in Paris. She's an accomplished artist and an award-winning author. She's fluent in many languages, as I repeated, and she has lived in several countries studying their traditions, literature, and religions. Rosemary, the floor is yours. Thank you.
Thank you, Maggie, for your hard work and kind words. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the voices from the Hidden Genocide 1918 today. I thank you all for spending your precious time with us this afternoon. I usually don't read from papers, but I want to limit myself. I, I want to limit myself, so I wrote it this way. I won't be um, going away from the subject. The main reason that I wrote um, the voices from the Hidden Genocide 1918 is to remember our victims on the anniversary of the 100 year of their martyrdom. Over 10 years ago, I wrote The Survivor in English in order to share our family story. It was also my way of giving a gift to my mother who was passing her last years on this earth. We had no pictures and no documents. I'm a sociologist that usually look at events from human and psychological angle. Historically, I was not able to find any documents and information about Kotorad. This is what the uh, survivors called it, the massacre. After visiting many libraries in different countries, even Armenia, I found only few, um, a few lines about the Armenian massacre in a major Armenian, Iranian history book. So I decided to rely on the words that I had practically pulled out of the mouth of my grandmother and a few survivors. I also painted 12 oil paintings, creating our family album. Of course, the faces were blank, as we did not know how my grandfather looked. I found new friends um, um, after after the survivor was translated to Farsi in Iran, it became a bestseller, now going to its um, third edition. And then after the three uh, other translations that I started receiving mails and pictures and phone calls from everywhere, mainly Iran, I found many new friends among the readers, especially with a prominent historian originally from Khoi, Dr. Muhammad Amine Ruyahi, who researched for 50 years and wrote the book Tariq -e Khoi, which is the history of Khoi. Um, unfortunately, he died less than a year later, but he was very generous to share his documents with me and put me in contact with the son of Dr. Eftekhar, who had protected my mother and father in his house for a year. All these events pulled me in the middle of a very complicated historical period, as many people had never heard about this massacre and knew nothing about the events. They asked me different historical questions during my lectures. I started studying the history myself and working on the invasions and massacres in Iran, mainly from 19, 1890 to 1920. From the beginning of uh, 2018, I was hoping that there would be an event or at least a mention in our community remembering atrocities committed against the innocent Armenian victims killed by the Ottoman government in Persia, Iran in 1918. As I did not see any activity or even a short article printed in, a pap in the papers, I decided to commemorate 1918 in my way, by writing a book. I knew my history book was not going to be ready soon, so I started writing a new testimonial book in order to remind the Armenian communities of their precious losses in Iran, and then tell the world about their silent voices that were intentionally hidden in history. I chose the lives of 27 survivors that I had either met or received their information. There are many amazing life stories in this book. Armenians who lost their dear ones and all their belongings in one day, like my grandmother. Other Armenians who were obliged and forced to convert to Islam, then after the chaos, 
they desired to return to their origins, but were not allowed by local laws. There are stories of mutual friendship among Armenian and Muslim Iranians and Christian neighbors who put their families in danger in order to protect their neighbors and friends. The voices of hidden genocide witnesses from one side, the Turks who hated, discriminated, and massacred the Iranian Armenians for no reason. And the other side, brave Armenians who suffered and lost everything. The hardworking survivors who tried to live for the sake of their children. Many Assyrians, as well as even Muslim Iranians, lost their lives and belongings because of the Ottoman invasions. The life story of an Assyrian family is also present in the book. The Kurds, encouraged by the Turks, often attacked, killing, killed, and looted the Armenian and Assyrian villages. First, and then the uh, Ottoman soldiers continued their unfinished actions during 1918. This was also an established pattern even before the genocide. But finally, in 1918, the final phase was put in action. Most of the Iranian Christians were massacred tragically in the cities as well as uh, in villages. Uh, all the villages were destroyed and emptied from the minority populations for good. Three stories from Turkey are also present in the book. Two of them were told to me, and the other one I was involved personally in the story. For each one of the 27 stories, I could have written a separate book of 200 or more pages, but I did not have enough time for that. I wanted to at least show the situation in each main city in Western Azerbaijan that the tragedy of genocide had passed through the Armenian homes in Iran. Probably the ideal suggestion would have been to write 27 books and present them in 27 evenings in order to share their stories with you. And this would have become like the Armenian version of Thousand and One Nights. Um, as this lecture is dedicated to the memory of Janet Samolian, I'm going to speak about her family story first. And if we have more time, I will explain for some other stories. Very shortly after the publication of The Survivor, I can't go there. Um, the Survivor, I received a call uh, from Janet, who wanted to interview me for the Armenian reporter. On our first meeting, as soon as we saw each other, something clicked between us. Um, as we say in Armenian, um, our blood pulled toward each other. She was very friendly and kind. I knew nothing about her, but she knew all about me because she had already read The Survivor. Soon I learned that her grandparents were also from the city of Khoi, like my grandparents. She told me that she was, um, that when she uh, read The Survivor, it seemed that she was reading her own family life story. There were many similarities between the two families. At the end of our meeting, we came to the conclusion that we might have been relatives, who knows. The only way that we could affirm was to do a DNA test, but what for? We already had found each other and soon became close friends. She was a true reporter. She found artists, writers, craftsmen, and many interesting stories. She, um, she traveled far distances to meet and interview them. She um, participated in the vernissage of exhibits and attended concerts and meetings. Wherever she came, whenever she came to Los Angeles, she would come to visit me by bringing newspaper cuts, pictures, or anything that she thought would help me. The last time that I saw her, she had a large folder in her hand. She told me that she was cleaning up her place. She had donated a lot of her documents and books to USC. 
she pointed to the folder and said, I have brought you all that I had from my mother's story. I always wanted to write my family's story, but after reading your book, I decided not to. Then she pointed to the documents and said, I thought you might need this one day. You can do what you want with them. I don't need them anymore. Almost a month after her visit, last visit, I received a card from Janet Sons inviting me for the memorial. I could not believe so sad and so soon. I started writing Janet's mother's story, the pure's story, first. I loved Janet. She was an amazing person, very sharing, kind and generous. On the contrary of one of our national habits, which is gossiping, Janet was a very positive woman. She never talked bad behind anyone. She was not jealous or envious. She always saw something good in each person, admired everyone's creativity, and was a precious, very sincere, and loving sp spirit. In Zepure's story, I have tried to keep her voice exactly true to her words and tapes. Zepure had a vivid memory at the age of nine years old. For me, her story is amazing, showing the life of the Armenians in Iran. Her childhood, the massacre, the devotion of her mother, who, like my grandmother and all the surviving young widows, worked very hard in order to give a good education to her children without complaining. And at the end, as she always repeated, her life ended in the beautiful America. Zepure's father and mother both had tasted losses and massacres from a very young age. Both of them were orphaned of their fathers. Turkish soldiers had killed them on different occasions. Both had grown up by their hardworking mothers. Later on, um, later one of Zepure's sister married to an Armenian American young man that I met their son in Washington state. He told me that his grandfather was originally from Turkey and worked at the American embassy. Uh, before the genocide started, as the situation became dangerous, in order to save his family, he hide, hides his wife and three sons in a wooden box and mails to the American embassy where he worked, how long and in which situation, emotional conditions were they in the box, his father had never shared. Zepure married to Samuel Samuelian in America. Her sister-in-law used to be a close friend of Zepure at school in Tabriz. When Samuel's sister was just 12 years old, soldiers had kidnapped and raped her. She never recovered, and all the family suffered because of it. I have lived with survivors of genocide all my life. And later, I have had my own tragedy in life. So I'm used to their behavior and the ways that the survivors of tragedies react toward the events that they face daily. For example, in the same family, Everyone reacts differently. Some of them do not talk and stay silent. Others cry, lay on bed most of the time, and remain deeply depressed. And a few turn into, the, into dead alive individuals. But there are some courageous survivors like Zepure who try to live their um, remaining lives the best way possible by staying positive and active. They work hard and study whatever they can, spend spreading hope and happiness around themselves. Zepure had a very strong, almost mechanical reaction towards tragedies. When she talks about the tragic events, she travels fast through the sad moments as if she doesn't have emotions and turns the page, the sad page, without showing any fragility. This is how um, she, she had survived. For example, when she met her father, 
who was hiding in the well before the Turks killed him. She is already detached. She says, as he was hidden in the dark, humid well for some time, when I saw my father, um, in, uh, he had already lost a lot of weight. His skin was paled and his eyes were flat because they had not seen the sunlight and he looked already dead. Then she continues to the next pages of her life story. When they traveled from, uh, for three days um, from Khoi to Tabriz, they crossed uh, the Armenian villages around uh, Salmast. She says, we saw the corpses of women and children piled up on the road. We passed through the dead bodies. First, we covered our eyes in order not to see the horrible repetition of the scene. Then, as if we were suddenly frozen, we became indifferent and unemotional, as if we lost our human feelings. We see that Zepur immediately detaches herself from the horrific scene that surrounded her. When she and her younger brother arrived to Manhattan from Tabriz, Iran, after more than a month traveling by train, ship, with not much uh, comfort and money, and many unfortunate adventures, the next morning of her arrival, she was already walking on the Fifth, Fifth Street, to Fifth Avenue, sorry, to look for a job. There was no welfare and no money collecting business at the time, and even if there was, it was not uh, neither her way or nor her education. When her older brother committed suicide in their apartment in New York, she continued going to work and later started a new life, always looking after her younger brother. When I compare the surviving Armenian women of genocide to the other nations, I'm surprised of their positive attitude and strength. At least the ones I knew never complained, worked hard, and poured their warm soul on their orphans and others who surrounded and needed them showering with their unconditional love and belief in God. I'm also thankful to Janet's second cousin, Sandra, who was interested in creating her family tree. She collected pictures from, um, let me, um, oh, later. Um, she collected a picture, um, pictures from her family, uh, entire family members. Like Janet, Sandra is an amazing, bright, and courageous young woman. I traveled two days north to Washington. She received me graciously, shared her uh, generously her albums and documents during my two-day trip. There are many important letters that are written in Old German between Mugerditch, Janet's grandfather, his younger brother, Zachar, and Lepsius, who had started his mission, first mission, by establishing the Armenian-German orphanage in Khoi, um, where Janet's grandparents and great uncles used to teach and take care of, their, of the children and their responsibilities. These letters are very important. As I am working on the history, each of these innocent letters affirm um, the historical events of the day. As Turks and Germans were allies, there is more clarity of the events when before the killings start. We read about the infiltration of the Turkish agents before the massacre in Khoi. Um, they write about the price of wheat and bread going up, the presence of epidemics, and so many of their historical events are present in these letters. There are real pictures in this book. We can see how the Armenians look in those days. They were, in, they were innocent, loving fathers, husbands, and sons who had faces to look at. And unfortunately, they were massacred from 10 years up just because they were Christian and Armenians. The Turks knew well that the thousands of individuals that they killed were not Armenian Turkish uh, citizens, but were 
Armenian Iranian citizens who had lived with their Muslim Iranian neighbors for centuries in friendship and peace. If this is not genocide, then what would you call it? Because of this main factor, I think the Iranian-Armenian genocide is very important to the genocide discussions. Although the number of the Persian-Armenian martyrs is not as high as in Turkey, but its, its meaning and its impact is very important. Plus, each single life is sacred to God and it should also be to us. This book opens up a main and unanswered question that remains. If the Turks denied the genocide of 1915, then why did they cross their neighbors' physical and geographical borders who was not in war with them? The Ottoman soldiers entered the neighboring country for no reason, killed the entire Armenian, Assyrian, and minority population, and destroyed and dropped their belongings in the western Azerbaijan in 1980. If this is not genocide, then what is it? So, um, this is actually very powerful, and uh, he did all kinds of things to stop them. So they didn't kill the Armenians or Tabriz, but they killed most the entire part, which were like Khoi, if you take, it was years ago, uh, I mean, uh, a century ago, it was 100% Armenian. Then it started becoming 80%, 70%. And then there were quite population they killed everyone. Some of the widows, they were with the young children. They left afterward. Uh, actually, the person I made it from them helped them to go to Tabriz, but they were hidden in Muslim houses. This is uh, um, Eastern, Western Azerbaijan, uh, where um, that's Maku on the top. That's Maku. And one thing I have found in history books interesting, uh, one of the visitors years ago, he, when he visited um, uh, uh, Maku, he was saying that's the only place in the world that he put his tripod to make pictures, and each leg of the tripod was in different countries. So one was in Turkey, one was in Russia, the other one was in Iran. And um, so this is uh, Khoi. This is Salmast, and uh, we have over here um, uh, the Garadagh. So this is, a, this is um, Azerbaijan. Um, Azerbaijan, now they call Iranian Azerbaijan and Turkish Azerbaijan. Turkish Azerbaijan never existed in history. It was always Iranian Azerbaijan, but because of the last uh, um, dynasty of Iran, they gave a lot of lands to Turkey, to Russia, because they owed them money. And that's how later on, with the help of Turkey and the Stalin, Azerbaijan was created. But um, uh, actually, I wrote in the book that we call it Azerbaijan, and the Turks call theirs Azerbaijan. So we change to get, we make it this the difference. This is what uh, Sandra gave me. So um, that's uh, Janet's uh, father, mother, brother, and the other brother who committed suicide, her husband, Janet, and um, her brother. Uh, this is um, Janet's family. Hoy was a beautiful place, uh, plenty of water, mountains, uh, the flower, the rose water of Khoi is very famous. And uh, so people would go picnicking. They say that um, the uh, Zoroastrianism started from here. There are uh, places which uh, it shows. 
and they have a lot of salt um, places. So they will go collect salt, but they would, they used to go, they had big yard, but they would go like picnicking. Um, this is um, how they were uh, separating. I don't know if, are, 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 are there any Iranians here? Because, yeah, probably you have seen when in villages they separate the straws from wheat, that's how they do the cows or the, they go around and they have wheels in the back. So they go so much turn around that they are separated. And normally the children go up there and sit and um, they just enjoy, that's their Disneyland. Um, this is the machine actually, the system. So uh, that's the thing that separates the wheat. And then they have to blow this in the air so um, they will separate the straw from the wheat. Um, this is in Janet's uh, family because uh, Janet's gra grandfather used to um, uh, we, uh, take apricots, dry apricots to Russia and from Russia to Europe. So they had to separate the, um, the seed from the, um, from the fruit and they would hire the Iranian Muslim women. They would come to their house, work for, but they were considered like family members. And there were sometimes uh, uh, Turkish uh, workers, they would come from Turkey because they didn't have work there in winter time. And Janet's parents would uh, place them in their house and they would work uh, from there, live there. That's Janet's family, the entire family in Khoi. And as you see, that's, the, that's very traditional Armenian uh, wear that uh, in Khoi they wore, the women, and sometimes they closed their mouth. This is Janet's grand. Oh, sorry. This is Janet's grandmother, and this lady. She didn't know the name, but she's a German, because they work with the orphanage, which was um, made with Germans. So they, she visited there, and that's the children, and that's the pure. And this is what is called corsi. So it's like a wooden table. Uh, they put um, charcoal underneath and then they cover with, it depends, with the cloths or with um, carpet and Persian rugs, and then they eat there, they sleep there, they work there. The children will do in one side homework, the parents will cook the other side, the mother would uh, knit the other side. So it's, it's a great thing in winter, and Hoi was very cold in winter time. Um, this is the priest of um, uh, Surpsarkis in Hoi, um, I have two people here, but they couldn't find, they couldn't remember their faces when they were this young. Uh, one of them was um, a cousin of my grandmother, and the other one is somebody who lives in uh, Tabriz. Uh, so this is a precious uh, picture. Um, this is uh, the, um, the Armenian German orphanage of Hoy. And um, that's Lepsius here, and that's the German director. Then um, the mother, uncles, which all they were killed. They were two uncles and his father. And Lepsius, this is the only picture that we have when he was young. Actually, in Armenia, they were in Tizarna Gabert. They were very happy to have this picture because uh, they never had a picture, a young picture of him. And this man has a big story with, uh, about him that not, it's not still yet very clear, but he was like supposedly teaching these orphans how to work with wood. But when the First World War started, he left the orphanage with complete uniform and medals toward Iraq and never, they didn't know what was he doing in orphanage, probably spying for many years actually. And these children were orphans from Hoi, but most of them, when um, Janet's grandparent was coming like from uh, Turkey or from Russia, there were many children which in different, you know, killings uh, between Armenians and Turks and the children would just run away and they would catch them on the roads and they would bring it to orphanage because um, they had lost their parents and they had nobody, they were just wandering in the deserts or mountains. Um, this is when the family goes, um, there was a first exit 
1914, when the war started, people started going to, uh, they felt the danger. So everybody left to Armenia or Russia or Kafkaz. And this is when they were in Russia, so they stayed there till it was safe, then everybody came back to Iran. These are the prominent members of, uh, of the Khoi um, city. So this man is very famous. I mean, they are very rich, wealthy, and uh, famous. His um, son, uh, well, this one, is also uh, amazing is that I wrote his story after Zepur's story because Zepur's father used to work with this man and um, which Janet called it Haji Bashi but it's not, it's Tajar Bashi. He was, um, he was like Janet's father was importer and he was the wholesaler. He would buy from Janet's father and then distribute it. And um, he had, I found his grandson. Uh, he was the first one actually to call me from Tabriz and sharing the story. And uh, his great grandson also. So um, he um, protected many Armenians in his house. And when the war finished, the chaos finished, the genocide finished, then his son, they changed some of them, their names, and he went to Tehran. He became member of the parliament. And uh, after six months or four months, he was lost. Nobody found him. He was very powerful. He could have found him by any means, but he couldn't find him. And uh, the, the thing was uh, they were saying that the Turks had kidnapped him and probably killed him just to revenge the father who had protected so many Armenians in his house. Um, so that's the man. And uh, his grandson was telling me when the grandmother, she lived like 90 something years old, even when she had dementia later in her life at 95 years old, she would still cry when she, somebody said Armenian, she would cry and say, you don't know what I saw. So she always, but Unfortunately, I didn't put all in the book because when I was writing the book, I asked them to see what I have written about their families, and he denied everything. So um, I think he's very much afraid. The Turks right now has infiltrated in Iran, in Tabriz, in Iran. So people are a little bit cautious because they don't know who is with Turks, who is with Iranians. So that's why they, I, I respected their wish because I don't want to put the family in danger. This is Surp Sarkis where you saw the children would go to school here. And they would say there's a tunnel which goes from here to Armenia, but that's just the kids would say. I don't know if it's true or not. But this is the oldest church that is building Christianity. It's still standing. And after my book came out and Armenians started going visiting there, so Iranian government has put that, I don't remember from which year, it's a historical monument, so they pay attention. Um, and uh, that picture was sent to me by, if you know, Armen uh, Nazarian. He had gone there and done some repair. So this man, he was working all his life with tourist organization. That's um, actually uh, the, the church. And when he read my book, he sent the picture at the beginning. He said, don't write it about me. Don't mention me. But when we were working, so the government put this land behind the church a little far, and they made three-story building. And when they were digging, they found tons of bones. And they, uh, they did the exam. And the bones were all supposed to be young boys and uh, men. Um, their uh, saying was that probably they came to protect themselves in church, but the Turks even entered church and killed everybody. So I asked him immediately if he had pictures of the bones. He said no, and he understood what, where I was going. He said, well, we put all the bones under this building, and we built the building uh, respectfully. We uh, buried them there. So I'm going faster. This is inside um, Surpsarkis. This is the, the gate of Khoi, uh, which is um, uh, very old. And if you see, there are two lions, like Jerusalem lions. It's more than 2,500 year old. 
This is inside the bazaar. This is where actually many Muslims protected Armenians. My great-grandmother had died there. And many Armenians, they, they were protected in bazaar because the Turks couldn't uh, go inside. They had walls. They had uh, um, many security things. And they wouldn't dare to go inside the bazaar. So many, but unfortunately, many died because the epidemic started. and. Um, and they didn't leave. So this is bazaar again. And that man that I said, he has st he had here a store, and his great son worked in that um, store with him. I mean, it's like a warehouse or showroom. This is another church, uh, Mahalazan. It's a little far from Khoi. And my mother always would say, why there isn't cross? Because the stroke, storks has done their nest on the top. It has been broken. Not everything is criminal. That one is the grandson of that man that I said his grandfather was very famous um, businessman. Um, not all of them were destroyed by people, but um, Hoi has earthquakes and flooding, so that's a part which happens. This is inside Mahalazan. Beautiful paintings, but unfortunately. Uh, this woman is the wife of my grandmother's uh, uh, brother, older one. Uh, his brother was saved because at the time of genocide, two brothers were in Russia. So they're from Khoi. And um, this is uh, the brother of my grandmother and his wife. She had put my great-grandmother on her shoulder and took from roof to roof to go to uh, um, to uh, Bazaar. That's my grandmother, but much after the genocide, not early pictures we don't have. This is the house of Dr. Eftekhar where my grandparents were hidden there, but the Turks, um, there's a big story that they came finally, they killed my grandfather in front of the eyes of my grandmother and mother, and um, they pulled his body with the horse in the streets. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Eftekhar, and these are his sons. That This younger one, he knew very good uh, Armenian. He worked with Serpazan Har Melik Tangyan for more than four years. Um, and um, I knew the older one. We became friends uh, after my book was printed. So that's how the historian put me in contact with them, and I, I got the pictures. Um, this is the only thing that I have heritage from my grandparents. The hat belonged to my grandfather, whose um, great-grandmother has done with needlework. And that's what my grandmother, which is uh, the silk of Khoi, uh, the silk was very uh, well um, uh, preserved. I, it was under her gothic she would put on her head. Um, this was a piece my mom gave me when I had the survivor. She said, I don't know why your grandmother had this here for you. Then um, I was putting on a blackboard just to show it was some, but I was surprised because my grandmother never uh, kept anything. Materials was nothing for her. And when I was putting there, um, oh, what happened? I think I touched something, it blocked. Maggie, do you know how to do? We have very few of them, but I can't. Anybody technical? I think my elbow touched something here. Oh, hold on. Try now. Thank you so much. So when I put it, I saw these little dots of blood, and I understood this should be the only thing which I have from my grandfather. That's his blood. My grandmother was wearing this scarf when they killed my grandfather. And uh, again, I don't need to do DNA because I know what it is. Um, this is a village which was 100% Armenian. And um, uh, one of the Iranians, they went, the Muslim friend that I found through correspondence, they went, uh, they took pictures, and he told me, the village is completely Muslim now, but I can feel the smell of Armenians, and we are missing them. 
Uh, it was called Vargur. Um, this is um, another the person that um, they are in. They were in Khoi. The Turks took the baby from her hands and threw in the river. And the sons, um, they just were spread in the city. They found each other much later, but she had lost. Uh, this picture I received just some months ago from somebody in Armenia that they were from Salmast. Uh, he doesn't know for sure if it was Salmast or Khoi, but his uh, grandfather was a uh, priest there. And they were lucky because they had left uh, Salmast and gone to uh, Armenia. So they are still in Armenia. And that's traditional dress again. And this is uh, many people of Salmas would wear that because probably the winds covering their mouth. Uh, so this is the family over there in uh, Armenia. Um, this is uh, a lady which um, uh, she gave me her pictures. Uh, she's from Haradar. And uh, this story is amazing. I, when I was finishing the book, I found in my papers a manuscript of like 30 pages. And I don't know who gave me. I always have the address, the name, everything. This one, I don't have anything. And he starts the story with I, I, I. And I don't know who he is, but it's an amazing story. And uh, this is, uh, again... Um, the other Janet, which uh, they went to Arabah uh, to visit, Haradah, sorry. And um, this is again, because the, the uh, nature is very rich over there. And the amazing thing after I went in the uh, book, just, uh, I mean, in her manuscript till the end of genocide, I stopped there when they went back um, to the villages. Um, but at the end, I know he was alive on 1975 because that's when my father died. And this is my father. Um, oh, this is my father. It was his first work after finishing Temagan in Tabriz. He got the first job to go in Garadar and teach there. And this is Melik Tangian here. And uh, so I was so surprised because he was talking. I don't know if he knew or not that my father was his teacher, and whatever Armenian he has learned, it's from my father. I was really very impressed. So this is the person from Turkey that I'm involved. And I will ask anybody here, if you're an attorney or you have other powers, please help me to find it, because I was a student in, uh, do we have time? Because this is, um, I was a student in Maryland years ago when I came first to America. Um, and. The, the director of a bank called me and uh, said if I can translate, because at that time in John Hopkins they had an um, international club. So I said, yes, I can translate in Armenian. So I went to this office. I was so surprised. It was the director with tie and suit. And I was there, a young girl, and there was a man, really homeless man. His hairs were all up, and his um, uh, whatever he was wearing, it was torn. And I said, what is he, he wants from me? So he pointed to the man. He said, this is the most important um, customer. We have client of bank. And then I started talking, translating. I understood that he had $1 million in the bank account, cash. And he had left, as you see, this is the only papers the Maryland um, city has sent me. So um, he, had, um, he had come to America. And he had started immediately working on ship. He had gone to Second World War, I believe, because he has his um, draft papers. His name was uh, Sahak Merakian. Uh, he signs his Merakian, as you see here, but uh, official papers are like Merakian. So um, he told me, I mean, the translation I did, I don't remember everything. But I know that he told me the money he has done, he worked all his life. He didn't marry. He collected the money just to give to Armenian organizations so there won't be another genocide. And we don't know where the money has gone because I contacted AGVU in New York, in different places. They contacted for me. Washington, D.C., I was in contact with the uh, priests and uh, 
different people. Nobody knows about him. I'm the only one to know him. And honestly, if the paper wasn't there, I would think maybe I have lost my mind. But I have my phone book. I have lost a lot of things when I moved from country to country. But somehow, the telephone book of this time was there, and his phone was there. So in the book, we have his address. The last thing that my son said I can do, maybe talk to uh, tax offices and see the last time. I'm sure he died around 1966, 65. I, can't, I have looked like uh, the death paper for, from the city they sent me for days. I can't find it. So I don't know where the money has gone, but in that young age that I was, I felt the director was dishonest. So probably he took the money last moment. The only thing I remember when I was, I went suddenly to Iran, and I received a letter from America saying, Sahak is in um, a hospital in very critical situation, and he's only asking for me, please, if you are around, come. And I didn't even answer because there was at that time no phone and things to do immediately. So I guess he died. And probably before dying, the director of bank wasn't leaving him alone. Whenever we met, he was there. All the time, he was behind this man. So probably before dying, he takes a paper. He says, would you sign this? You have, you have forgotten. And it was written, give it to me, the money. I don't know. So I'm still looking for the money because it belongs to Armenian organizations, Any anybody, church, church. Uh, um, um, any organization, educational, whatever, but I don't know where the money is. And maybe I was hopeful because some months ago I read about, um, you know, the the big German company that the wife was, um, his, her father was half um, Jewish and the mother was German. So he was with this big industrial person, which they have the bagels and um, I think uh, the peat uh, coffee. So the children just, uh, they are not even Jewish, but they found out that their grandfather was killed by Nazis. And they have donated so much money to Jewish organization. So I'm hoping we can find the children of this guy. Maybe they will have conscience to give back a little money to our organizations. And at the end, I would like just to say that the story of Zepur, my grandmother's story, there was somebody in Iran who wanted to make a movie, but unfortunately he's in prison now. If this was a Jewish uh, story, it would have been another Anne Frank. I think the Armenians is the time to come and take the stories and make it really known to the world because I think Iranian genocide is very, very important. It's not the number imports, but why did they cross the borders? Thank you. If you have any questions, I can ask. Yes. Yeah, did the uh, Iranian government or Iranian army intervene at any time? Well, actually, the. The survivor was in a, a book award. Um, I entered in a book award, and two of the jurors gave uh, a high mark. The next one said, where was the Iranian army that uh, didn't come to help Iran Armenians? And I said, oh, nobody knows the story. So history, I mean, um, that's what happened, and that's why I'm working on the history to present it. The, uh, the dynasty was Rajar, it wasn't uh, Pahlavi, which is the last one. They were very weak and um, they, were, they only enjoyed life with women and money and traveling later on. So there was no army. Uh, actually, the palace was protected by Cossacks from Russia. So uh, it was really a piece of cake, big cake, Iran, that everybody was interested to have a piece of it. That's why there was nothing, nobody could protect. Armenians protected themselves a lot, but like my grandfather was on the horse, he, she put, he put my grandmother on the horse and the baby, which my mother was three years old. They were going to go away, and somebody came from Dashnak uh, group and said, no, you stay 
Andranik is coming, so you are defending the city. And unfortunately, Andranik was taken in the way to do another war. I forgot to show the last image. Um, this is uh, the lady on the right. She is actually a Muslim uh, Armenian. I mean, she has Muslim name. It's, her name is Islam Pana. It, it, it means uh, protected by Islam. And her father was in Khoi, and uh, he realized that, he, I mean, he knew he was Iran Armenian, but he couldn't do anything. So he said when he married with an Armenian woman, he sent her children to Tabriz to study Armenian. And they were really bullied a lot because they would say, why do you come study Armenian? You're Muslims. And they're very, very Armenian. And this boy is the great-grandson of that rich man that was working with Janet's grandfather. So he has sent me, his architect, and he has sent me many pictures and documents. And so I could only send the two books via Armenia because we can't send directly books to Iran yet. So they were very happy to receive. So there was no army, that's the answer. And. Um, uh, in Iran, besides the government, central government had no power, but on the contrary, the people who were around, the big landlords, they were powerful. We have the story of Maku, which is in the north. You can read it, that uh, it's amazing. I mean, the Sardar of Maku, he was one of the relatives of the Shah, but he was really uh, very powerful. He had more army than the country. May I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Cohen, have you uh, researched any foreign archives other than the family ones on reports of there? Because it is known that U.S. had uh, foreign services in Tehran and in Tabriz, and the Presbyterians' missions were there as to leave. Uh, um, you know, I went to, I haven't gone, uh, I was in Washington, D.C., just giving a lecture but I didn't have the time to go over there to see. Many documents were closed till now. They have started opening up. And I went to France because in France the, the uh, Jesuits were very active and I couldn't find any document. Somehow, um, I, uh, one thing which is known, it's in Iran even, they didn't talk about this. Only Dr. Amin Riyahi talked about and uh, two, three lines, the other person. Um, the reason is, I learned it after the book came out, that they um, cleaned up completely the Armenian genocide in Iran because when the, killed, um, the Turks killed all the Armenians, then when they were leaving the country, they did something and they told them that this was an Armenian Muslim Christian war. It wasn't genocide, it wasn't the Turks. You know, the Turks, um, they can wash their hands very easily. And the Iranians believed it. Actually, the father of this boy, he called me the first time, and he said, I want to kiss your hands. I said, why? And he said, because it's 70 years I'm living in guilt. They told me my grandfather had killed your grandfather, and I don't know why they should kill them, because, Armen because Iranians love Armenians, even now. And uh, so they uh, cleaned up everything in Iranian documents about this, um, so nobody will talk about because they were feeling guilty. Um, I went to Tizernagaber, there weren't much. Since my survivor book, there are many new books that came up. Actually, uh, six months ago, somebody in uh, Alix um, newspapers, editor, he passed his thesis in Iran for this subject, and he wants to do more. So I know like three theses are going on, and, but there aren't many documents, and one of the documents, which the only one will be important, it will be in the uh, Tabriz um, church. But unfortunately, I was invited, they like me, but I don't trust to go, and my children don't want me to go. I have the name Cohen in the back, and. Right now, Iran and Jews are not really in good terms, so um, that's why I can't go to the documents in Iran. Yeah, I think you should check the U.S. State Department. I haven't. You have? No. There, there is tons of material. There's at least 14,000 pictures and documents. Uh, there's been a British and French commission 
studying the Armenian massacres as well as Assyrian and Kurds. There's a lot of plenty, very, uh, a lot of information there. Thank you. I will. And I did make a copy for you so that you have it, about 7,000 documents. Okay. Yeah, the, <laughs> I was waiting. Okay. The purpose of the Turkish military that came to Iran was to take over the lands or specifically they came to oh, no, no. take care of the Armenians? They came to, you see, it's a very, very, I was talking to the lady here before, it's a very, 1918 is a very complicated period in Iran. It's um, after war, Russia is busy with the revolution. Correct. Uh, Europeans are busy with their um, people who have died and after war. Mm -hmm. So the Turks, I think Armenians always insult Turks. I think our Turks are amazingly smart people. I mean, they have stupid places, but they are very small in politics. They planify and they sit. They don't, they don't do like us. We Armenians, we are uh, warm-headed. So if something happens, immediately we punch, even if there are 100 people around us. But the Turks sit there and wait for the time. They wanted to get rid of Armenians completely because um, the, um, the um, Gama War, which was coming from uh, Russia, Kafkaz, to go to Turkey, they were passing through Iran. So That's like right. in my grandfather's house, um, uh, I mean, my grandmother said she didn't know what they were talking, but she was taking food to them. They had hidden place that they would be there, and uh, Andranik was there in our house many times. So they were coming, and people would protect them, they would give them food, but they did also to others, not only Armenians. So the Turks just wanted to get rid of it. And when the genocide happened, many of Armenians, they came to Iran just to go to Russia, to Armenia. They didn't want to stay in Iran. Some stayed, but not everybody. And they didn't want, they wanted to finish. That's what is genocide. They want to finish the race. They, they can't, but they tried. Was anybody supporting them? Sorry? Was any country supporting Turks? Can I use a bad name? <laughs> Everybody was prostitute in this matter. Because one of the things you think in Britain was with us wasn't. Everybody was getting money and uh, their profit. When it was good for them, they would be with us. When they, somebody else paid them more, they went there. Russians did the same. Everybody did the same to Armenians. And one of the things which really hurts me, it's in Tabri, in Khoi, there were, I don't remember, it's in the book, 4,000 or 8,000 Armenians that were there, young boys, uh, and the Gama War, they were there, and they knew Turks are coming, the Ottomans, and there were 25,000. They have cannons, they have everything, the Germans had uh, put them a lot, everything in their possession. They wanted to go back, and the dirty British, they said, no, go fight, we are coming. So the young boys, they went 8,000 or 4,000 in front of 25,000 with their little guns. They started fighting the entire day. They killed everybody. And Britain never came because they wanted to go to India. They didn't care for us. They wanted... Iranian petroleum, they wanted the road to India. Everybody was like that. Like from Kafkaz, Armenians who were there powerful, they were sending food to um, uh, soldiers. And in the Russian army, there were as well as Armenian generals and they were Turk generals, not Turk, Muslim generals. The Muslim generals were doing sabotage so the food would not go to Andranik and the soldiers. So everybody was dirty. Nobody was really with us. America, yes. America was because he was very young. It was a young country. They didn't know still Middle East that well. They just came there to help. And of course, Turks immediately put the gossiping saying, oh, uh, he was a doctor actually. 
And they said, oh no, in the house of doctor, there's a lot of guns, they are distributing, and they are doing this, they are doing that. So nobody was with us. And I don't think we have ever to think of anybody with us. That's why I don't care if American president, Russian president, whoever accepts there is genocide or not. I don't care. I know it was. It's true. My grandmother was there. Why don't I have a grandfather? I never had any uncles and aunts. So where do I come from? If they don't want to accept, they're ignorant. Yes. Actually, it was attack against Armenians, but it was attack to the Iranians too. Yes. My question is, what was the response of Iranians and what was the response of Russians? Yes, Muslims lost a lot. Their villages were destroyed. The people were killed. The Assyrians were the same way. It was really a genocide of complete, you know, they just, they, and one thing you can see, I mean, I learned this when I wrote the Garadagh story, because in Garadagh's story, only in one day, the man says he left with his mother. They would, as soon as the Turks would come, they, it was a village in a way that from this side, when the soldiers would come, this side they would see and run in the forest. And I have a friend in Armenia, and maybe you know uh, Gurgen Melikian. He's collecting money to plant trees in uh, Garabakh. And I have been there seeing the trees and planting. And I didn't understand 100%, but he was in the war. He was saying it protects soldiers, it protects people. So when I was, I was writing this book, I saw it's really protecting because they were running in the dark um, forests and the Turks wouldn't follow them. But when they would come back to the village, they lost less population. But when they came in the village, everything was gone. They would take one day only, they took like 250 sheep, uh, 300 cows, 300 horses, plus all the grains, all the food. So how do you want Turkey to feed his soldiers? Armenians were feeding them. They were coming, robbing and going. It's not only, I mean, killing Armenian, yes, that's one point. But there was also economical point. They wanted to have them food, everything for them. Thank you. Number two, uh, in your introduction, you mentioned that this work could have been 27 volumes. And therefore, my question is exploring through you what may have been in the 27 volumes that obviously we don't have it. Sorry? I didn't understand I'm trying the to last explore one. through you what material is out there that could have been part of the 27 volumes. No, no, so I'm I mean going, the two no, 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 listen to what I'm going to say. Recently a book was published on the same period where they were talking about Armenian revolutionaries going from Ottoman Empire to Russian Empire to Persian Empire, so on and so forth. In your materials that you have, but, but by the way, I do not find that book very convincing as revolutionaries and so forth. Therefore, that's where my question is coming. Do you have any material from this period that talks about those people? Yes, in uh, Tariq Khoi, he has written a lot. The Armenians, actually, the revolutionaries, the Dashnaks were the people who would, because at the same time there was constitutional revolution in Iran, uh, besides, before the massacre. That's why the country was, um, you know, uh, weakened a lot. So Armenians were helping the uh, Democrats in Iran or the, um, the constitutional revolutionaries um, to, to achieve their goals. So they were, do in Tabriz, there was a big shop they were repairing guns, they were doing everything. But like one of the things they couldn't understand because after the government took over, he, they started going after revolutionaries and revolutionaries went, the only place they could go, it was Turkey. But they didn't like to be in Turkey, but that was the only country was giving them protection. So uh, 
you know, it's it's really complicated period, but there are in the book of Tariq um, Khoi uh, about the period, and it says actually like one of the things uh, there were two brothers that the government of Iran just shoot them and their bodies were hanging from the trees, and uh, you know, so there was there was war between not war, but there was a struggle between central government and uh, revolutionaries and the Armenian revolutionaries were helping revolutionaries, but then the re re Iranian revolutionaries turned against Armenians because they were working with Turkey. Yes. I was wondering if uh, you can get any information from the uh, church in Tabriz like Melik Tangyan's uh, period? Well, you know, Melik Tangyan, he did everything he could do. I don't think, I think we have to really name him saint in Armenian mm -hmm. church because he was amazing. He put so, he was, he brought all the orphans. He was sending people to uh, Hoy, to Salmas, to uh, everywhere to collect the Armenian, remaining Armenians to bring it to Tabriz. He was collecting money from the rich people like Tumanians and the others to give to feed them because all these people were arriving uh, in Tabriz with no food, nothing, no protection. Mm -hmm. They were feeding them. They started putting in the schools. And um, the, he did so much. He was even insisting the young boys marrying the widows because he said, we have lost population. We have to repopulate the city and the region, I mean. So sometimes the tragedy was that one of the husbands would come back and the wife was married and having children with somebody else. But that was rare. But he did everything. I mean, he was involved in personal life of people up to uh, school and uh, religious life, everything. And he was very, very much liked, respected by Iranian government. And when he died, it was, I wasn't there, but it was huge uh, uh, ceremony for his uh, burial. I recently uh, read in Aspares that uh, the bishop uh, in Tabriz, unfortunately, I don't remember Church his name. Chepchian. Churchian? Yeah. Churchian. Anyways, uh, uh, the pilgrimage to uh, Serb Tadevos and Serb Stepanos uh, cathedrals in the northern part. Oh, that has always been. That no, uh, what uh, he was saying in the same article is that uh, even nowadays, the Azerbaijanis are watching the Armenians and their activities. And uh, they used to have uh, April 24 uh, in the streets, but now they just confined to the courtyard of the church. Well, as because I told you, this boy, he told, this man, he told me, before when he dated girls in Tabriz, he just moved to Tabriz because his mother is very sick, but he was in Tehran. He said the girls would talk to, uh, we would talk Farsi together, and now the girls insist that you talk Turkish because the Turks had infiltrated in Tabriz. Right. You know, one of the plans, I don't know if you have heard, when the Shah of Iran was uh, uh, left Iran, he said one thing, he said, please don't make Iran Iranistan. Um, one of his, um, the ministers that I have worked a lot with him, he was with Shah in Egypt. And he said the entire time when he was dying, he was saying, don't, and I said, what does it mean? Because we say Kurdistan, and, right. and he said, actually, that's what he said, because the plan, the Shah knew what will happen, all these wars will happen, and he was saying, please protect Iran not to become Iranistan, means a small place, because always Russia wants uh, Azerbaijan, Turks want that, Britain wants uh, Abaddon, and you know, everybody wants something. So if this government is not smart, it's going to crack and everybody will take a piece of it. That's right. So that's why the 
yeah, Armenians in Azerbaijan, in uh, Tabriz, they are a little bit afraid. They are low key. Yes. They are. But the government is with Armenians still. How far the um, Turkish soldiers were able to come to the south, and why they stopped coming further to Tabriz? And well, um, there is a saying I don't want. Uh, I mean, I know that's the truth, but um, I have to do more research. Uh, when the Turkish army was coming, actually, the, the man who was the chief there, that's the one who killed my grandfather. Uh, and uh, he was in front of the army. And Melik Tangyan goes in front of them. You know, in the way in Iran, it's always bakhshish. So he had made a big box of gold uh, and a lot of dime. I, I mean, at that time, there was a diamond. They were almas or, and uh, emerald and things like that. A lot of jewels on it. And he takes it uh, in a tray to offer to the chief of um, the army. And there were all the Armenian students from school. They were there with the flags, Turkish flags. And they were chanting uh, for the Turks, their national heim. I mean, think of uh, uh, Melik Tangyan, who hates them, but he does all these things to protect his people. And he goes in front of them with his people, with the people of the uh, head of the church. And I heard that uh, when they arrived near the Turk, with tray he gives him. And the Armenian, which was with Melik Tangyan, he just does like this. Uh, his uh, jacket, you know, he turns like this. And uh, they say that he was very high-ranked uh, mason. And uh, he showed, he knew the uh, soldier, the chief of the army was mason, but he was lower grade. And he tells him, go back. And Melik Tangyan, of course, with doing all these things, he goes back. But in masonry, you can't command something if they haven't told you to do. So this Armenian man put his life in uh, danger. He told the Turk to go away. He went away. And when he was going away, he said, just tell Armenians to stay three days in their houses. If they are in their house, we won't kill. If anybody puts the foot out, we will kill. There were two people killed. One went, I, I don't know, to bring the mother-in-law home. He was killed. The other one went to buy bread. These are the two killed, but the rest were saved. And the man who did this, he was poisoned uh, with their group, and three days he suffered a lot and he died. But he, was a, he saved all the Armenian population. Your big hand to um, Mrs. Dr. Cohen. Thank you. We do have the book available, Voices uh, from the Hidden Genocide and other publications available, and we do have a light reception downstairs. Thank you. I just also want to remind you that there is a conference at UCLA this coming Saturday and Sunday. It's called Diaspora and Stateless Power, and that's a conference in honor of Khachik Tololian, October 12, 13, at Rolf Hall at UCLA. And then there's a conference on Armenian genealogy, November 15 and 16. I believe it is by uh, re um, reservation with an admission fee, and that's going to be in Montebello. Thank you.